Mike Rock Talk. I am here with Mike Rogers, Frank Adelblut, and Max Abramson. We are talking about the governor's race and some issues and this and that and the other thing. Uh, don't forget to check us out at, at uh, granitrock.com and of course please visit cnht.org. Their picnic is coming up on July 9th. You can go get tickets online at cnht.org or you can get them at the door, but space is limited. It's in Manchester this year. So it's a little closer to southern New Hampshire. If you're a little farther north, you got a little bit more of a haul. But uh, it's a great event, and CNHT is a great organization, and they are worth the 15 bucks. Plus, they're going to feed you, and you'll get to hear James O'Keefe. Uh, all right, so back to the business at hand. Frank Edelblut is a representative of the New Hampshire State House. He is running for the governor's office. Um, we briefly touched on the economic barriers. Um, obviously, the other... I don't know if elephant's the right word, is the opioid crisis. I had uh, a couple of uh, New Hampshire State Senate candidates here last week, and we talked about that, so we should talk about that because everybody's talking about that. Let's talk about opioids. Is that what we want to do? Yeah, and, 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 and free market solutions and not uh, not having the heavy hand of government uh, except where strictly necessary. Yeah, so let's start with when we talk about opioids, I think that we have to acknowledge that, uh, you know, a drug dependence is generally a symptom of an underlying problem. And if you keep treating symptoms and you don't treat the underlying cause of that, you're not really going to create a solution. Um, and so I think we just have to put it in that context all along. But we have a good example of a free market type of solution that's functioning in Manchester now. I'm, I'm you know, impressed. So um, in Manchester, they have their safe stations uh, program, which they have put in place, which honestly, there's a representative, uh, Victoria Sullivan, who brought a bill to do the exact same thing and got all kinds of pressure in the House. And it was unsuccessful legislatively, but it's been, hap- it's been done in Manchester already. And it keeps being touted as a success story in the city. Uh, it doesn't cost the city any money, but folks now can get themselves connected through that, uh, through the fire stations, through into um, different treatment programs. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're talking about doing something like that in uh, Nashua as well. But nobody had – there was a, not a program. You know, it didn't cost money. We didn't have to appropriate anything, and we're basically – beginning the process of cutting off basically the demand for illicit drugs. And it, I think that's an economic tool. Mm-hmm. And the more we use economic tools against this, I think we're going to be more successful uh, because it is a criminal enterprise that's, you know, driving this thing. And, mm-hmm. uh, and so there's an example of a free market solution that has some traction right now. Sure. And, uh, you know, does the Manchester city government have anything to do with uh, that successful program in Manchester? Yeah, so I don't honestly, honestly know how it came about. I mean, I know that Vicky, Vicky Victoria Sullivan, she doesn't like Vicky. Sorry, sorry, Victoria. <laughs> uh, Victoria Sullivan, you know, initiated that process. Um, mm-hmm. You know how that how it ultimately got implemented. I'm not, you know, familiar with that. I was reading about it in the Union Leader because I hadn't been familiar with it. Uh, I don't know if somebody just came up with it. It could have been an alderman or somebody, you know, some somebody on the city council or whatever. But uh, it is a good idea of a use of existing. Bed space infrastructure, and right. infrastructure for something like that. I mean, as long as it doesn't all of a sudden need to appropriate millions of dollars, you know, that's a good thing. Um, I think there is some private interest in um, rehabilitation, treatment, detox, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but that's definitely the way to go. I mean, I think that the state should be favorable to institutions, private institutions that want to make themselves available on the same terms, basically. Right. I mean, you know, so that we don't have to spend another $1.2 million every year for this or that or the other thing. Because like you said, um, you know, we, whenever we talk about opioids, I bring up Theodore Dalrymple because he's written lots of books on a doctor from Britain. You know, I won't go into that again. But, um, you know, he his biggest problem is that when you have something like this, the natural reaction of the government is to build a bureaucracy that never goes away. Right. And that's what concerns me. Obviously, yes, there's a reason why people are taking these drugs. It it may or may not be because of other prescription painkillers. It may or may not be because even though we have a 2.6% unemployment rate that there's young people who can't find jobs. It may or may not be that somebody took a queer gender studies and got a degree and can't find a job. You know, It may be a lot of different things. It may be cultural. It may be family-related. Um, there's but a but lot see, what you're getting to is that there's an underlying problem. So right. what, what happens is too often the government programs that we've seen come through the legislature are kind of uh, quick fixes. In other words, like so we'll get you into a 28-day dry-out period or a 90-day dry-out period or a 60-day dry-out period. The problem is 
that this, in order to get, you know, to break through the addiction, it has to be long-term treatment, which is 18 to 24 months. It has to be 24-7 because you basically have to disconnect from that network of people that you get drugs from. And it has to be holistic, to your point. You know, what? there's a reason why you're turning to drugs at some point. And if we don't solve that reason and we just, like, turn people back out, eventually they're going to find themselves back in that cycle of dependency. So. Well, it, and that is, it is cultural. I mean, a lot of these people, those are the people they've been hanging out with. Right. And so those people, I mean, those people aren't stopping. So however they got there, um, they need to have a new path. They need to be a new direction. Government should be as limited as possible in that. I, I, I mean, I know that there's – we do tons of things in the private sector with suicide assistance. Um, right. All kinds of companies have great programs. You know, yeah. Alcoholism is almost entirely treated privately for yep. the most part. Um, so I don't think this is any different. I would just want to avoid creating that bureaucracy, which then never goes away and only ever gets bigger and bigger and bigger and more expensive. And this is a small state. We can't afford one of those. We have enough of those already. <laughs> Although actually, if you, you know, if you look at it, so when we set up the alcohol fund you know, 10 years ago, 8 years ago, whatever it was, um, you know, to deal with addiction problems, uh, you know, over the years, that fund has been raided. So we've taken $53 million out of that fund that was supposed to be for addiction, education, everything else. So I almost feel like legislatively, you know, the state basically said, okay, this could potentially be a problem. We need to fund it. They created a mechanism for that. They put the program in place, but they've, they've then taken the money away from that. Had they had an education program in school saying drugs are bad, don't do them, they'll make you stupid, you know, maybe we would, some of those people wouldn't be addicts today as a result mm-hmm. of that. So, I mean, when we set a course, we have to, like, recognize that, okay, we do need this, we, and we can't then go raid those funds out of there. There is an important distinction here, though, because if we were going to spend a lot of money, we would want to if, – if this was something the people of the state wanted to do, if taxpayers were willing to support this – um, you can die from detoxing from alcohol. Nobody has ever died from detoxing from heroin. That's a three-day thing. The rest of it's all in your head, and it's like you said, it's your culture. When you come off being an at addicted to alcohol, and I know this because I grew up with them, you can die from that. Can that you really? can kill you. That. Okay. Coming out of an alcohol addiction can physically change you to a degree where you die. So you really need... You know, and then of course treatment. The, the so mental treat, part, right. the mental part, is lifetime after that because you can always go back. It's right. the same with heroin, but you can get off of heroin in a couple of days with flu-like symptoms and taking like ibuprofen for minor discomfort. So it's not that difficult. But the mental part, it's what got hard. you there in the first place, that's very difficult. The underlying cause, right? Okay. So anyway, um, what else is going on in the state of New Hampshire? I think that we've been spending an awful lot of time tying ourselves to federal money. Oh, yes, can we talk about that? Yeah, we yeah. can. Before we get yes. off the drug topic, one, one of the reasons that I finally agreed to put my name in for governor is <laughs> that I saw how all of these European countries solved the drug problem. From a, I have been saying this for the last two years in the State House, and I've been saying it before then, uh, before I ran. The drug problem from a public policy standpoint was one of the easiest problems to solve. It would be very easy to do it. Unfortunately, Washington, D.C. continues to micromanage it. They continue to run Lyndon Johnson's War on Drugs, big social engineering experiment. And Granite Hammer went through, and I wanted to speak against it. And it's just it's just another thing that they just they keep doing the same thing over and over and over and throwing more and more money and resources at the problem, and they just keep making it worse. Well, I mean, yeah. what we have to, what we really, um, we have to do is we have to, I call it, say, use economic tools. You know, if we can dry up the demand for this illicit drug, then the business is going to go away because the business is going to be there as long as they can get, they have a market for it. We so, need Jesus in the permanent record. All right. I want to say, if you make it more difficult for the supply to get here, you'll drive up the price, but you don't dry up the demand. That, that's like a and speed it, bump to these guys or a it, pothole, you it know? It makes it more profitable and, uh, for the criminals to keep going. In right. England, it just raises crime. Petty crime, property crime. Exactly. Anyway, so anyway, federal money is huge. So, federal, um, so here's one of the things I talk about on the campaign relative to federal money that has just, uh, you know, it's, it's irking me right now is in the whole education area. Um, I don't know if you know this statistic, but I just recently, um, you know, pulled these numbers. But federal contributions to our K through 12 education are 6%. That's it. <laughs> You know, this week, property tax or our property owners across the state got their property tax bills. They're kicking in seventy-three percent of the cost of a K through twelve education. They don't have a seat at the table, and for that six percent, you know, these guys down in the federal government, they want to give us, they want to tell us what to teach our kids, they want to tell us, teach us, give us Common Core. 
they want to give us the assessment, smarter balance, psychometric assessment, as opposed to just academic assessment Did you learn, you know. Uh, they want to tell us how to feed our kids, and they want to tell us what bathroom the kids are going to go in. And for that 6%, how can that have such an exaggerated role in local education? It's the tail wagging the dog right now. And we it, really- it, it, it's about the concentrated share versus the distributed. You know, it's like you found a company, and as a CEO, even after dilution, you own 6%. But all the thousands of shareholders own half a percent each. Right. And unless they band together, you still win. Which is why we need local property tax holders who are kicking in 73% in New Hampshire to basically say, wait a minute. These are our schools. We're the ones who are kicking in all the money for them. So we need to have a, a seat at the table in terms of what goes on there. First, we need the legislature to overturn Claremont, which if I understand constitutions correctly, when the judges make a mistake, the legislature can enact a law saying, no, you don't. Uh, and then the other thing is, like with Croydon, one of the problems is, is that a lot of taxpayers are continually running up, up against a legislative wall where they don't get the opportunity to pick and choose, which we've been doing for years. I mean, right. state law is very clear to me. You can you can send your kid wherever you want. But right. I believe that Croydon is within their li- – without the bill that we tried to pass to make right. it crystal clear, yeah. I think Croydon's within their rights to be able to um, tuition those kids but then to again, the Montessori school. But again, it's that 6%. And the people at the state board and the people in local federal <coughs> government and the people in local government who feel beholden to that 6% number, whatever it is, um, are all in against parents. How do we oh, – well, okay. So how do we get parents involved? <laughs> how do we engage parents yeah. in the process? I mean, what, what – you know, let's use Trump as an example. He has engaged a large number of people who didn't register to vote previously, who weren't involved, and he did it by pointing out that – our immigration policy, like it or not, is bringing in people who want to kill us. Yeah. And that's how he became extremely popular because that's what everybody's thinking, but he stood up and said it. Right. What needs to happen in New Hampshire? I thought Croydon might be. Maybe Croydon's too small. Um, so I think actually that what we need is there's, there is a – the opportunity available to us to make kind of a systemic shift in terms of education. So today, education, like the number one um, kind of guiding factor is time. In other words, like let's take high school. So high school consists of four years, 180 days a year. It's like I did my time. It's like a prison sentence. You know, I got through. Uh, the variable component. So that's fixed. You have to do this. Cue Johnny, cue Johnny Cash right there. There you go. Right. Well, but the variable component is did I learn anything? A, B, C, D, F. You know, so you could literally do your time and not learn anything. And that's not really getting us to an outcome. So I think we need to flip these around and it will be have the effect of – transforming education. There's a lot of other things that can happen around that so that, you know, students can go in and some kids are going to be able to finish those requirements in two years. I used to say three years, but an educator told me they could probably finish the academic rigor aspects that they need. You could probably get that in two years. And so it's going to disrupt the status quo, the industrial education system that we have that just, again, is all based on time, like, I just did another year here. Uh, And so I think that's the the initial thing that we need to flip. And the thing that's interesting is we already have in our statutes the ability to do that. We already have in our ed regulations, ED306, the ability to do that. I mean, students in New Hampshire, according to the ed regulations, can graduate by showing proficiency – in subjects. And it doesn't say that you have to do the time. It says that you have to show the proficiency in order to get the graduation certificate. That, that's, that, that's actually fantastic. So, um, look, you know, the feds kick in 6%, yes. and uh, they, uh, they are responsible for the extra overhead, the extra staffing, and all sorts of jumping through hoops, which must be adding 40% to our costs. Uh, you know, I, I remember when Ovid ran for governor, he said that the feds were supposed to be kicking in 40% of the cost of the programs they mandated, and we're kicking in about 17%. Okay. So if that 17% of 40% represents 6, you know, 6% <laughs> of the total, whatever. What's left, right? What, what, whatever. It's not very much. And it's time to say to the feds, we don't need the money, and we'll go our own way, thank you. And we could probably reduce the cost of the schools into the bargain. Well, I think we do it two ways. We, we, I'm going to flip your sentence around. You know, you started, we don't need the money. We'll go our own way. How about we say, like, we're going to go our own way. By the way, that is our money, you know, right? Because we're the ones who are funding that down there anyhow. And then we basically, there are some programs we're going to say, like, if you're going to, you know, if those are the strings that are attached, no, thank you. We're not involved. Or there's other programs we just push back and say, we're going to take the money, but those strings aren't acceptable to us. We're not going to have them. We get, we, you know, education is a state issue. You know, we 
need to take responsibility for this and and tell them that look, you're not responsible for this. You don't get to tell us how to educate how to do right. local education. And, and and then of course you know that the feds will say, well, if you're not going to follow all the strings, you don't get the money. And of course it is, as you say, our money. However, they derived it by taxation or printing doesn't really matter. It's right. our <laughs> money. The question then is, are our four Washington denizens actually going to stand up and fight for us to get that money? You know, I don't know if the four denizens are going to stand up and fight, but as governor, I'm going to stand up and fight. In other Which words, I'm going to push back. Brings me to my next question, and we only have about two and a half minutes, so hopefully we can fit it in. Um, being constitutional conservatives and tenthers, basically – uh, we're always looking for a governor who is willing to read the Tenth Amendment and apply it appropriately. What's your stand? Yeah, so, I mean, I think that it's about time that we recognize – it's almost as if the Tenth Amendment has been lost here in this state. You know, I don't think that the governors that have been sitting in that corner office even, you know, recognize that it's part of our Constitution. We need to begin to – push back and where the federal government has gone beyond the bounds of the enumerated powers that are outlined for it, we need to say, no, we've got that. This is our responsibility. Uh, you know, taking the money or not taking the money is a subset of that. You know, we basically assert our responsibility, but I'm not really, I'm not willing to just say like, and then I'm going to roll over and not take the money because, uh, you know, uh, they say they're going to put strings. I'm going to say like, I'll take the money and, and you can keep the strings, by the way. So... <laughs> Right. I, 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 I would love to see if that will work. So, If it doesn't, then we'll go to another strategy. But, again, we've got to begin. You know, we have to start our negotiation at a strong position. Yeah, you need a, you need a, a strong uh, banding together of governors to make the senators go to Washington and, and, I think and, we can do and that. fix this. Uh, that, that, that would be terrific. So how do people reach you and your site and your campaign and donate or volunteer? Okay, so you can find me on the Internet at frankedelblue.com. And I don't know if you guys have a banner on this in, in any way you can put up. Or is this live stream? Yeah, okay. We're we, li- well, we could, but I don't know if you can find it or anything. I, I, don't, I don't think I can right now. We'll – uh, Right there. Okay, there you go. Yeah, but we, but what we can we'll, do is we'll attach – We'll link to it when we, we – Yeah, we can okay. attach the podcast. We can attach, so. to, attach it to the podcast. You can find me on Facebook, Frank Edel Blue for Governor on Facebook. Uh, and our off our campaign offices are down in at uh, 340 Granite Street, Street – sorry, Granite Street in Manchester – And I hope you'll stop by and uh, reach out to the campaign and get yourself involved. We need your help.